You just never know when a non-typical buck is going to show up on your property. Why? Well, because non-typical bucks are created in different ways, and mainly it's something you have no control over. So what's your favorite flavor? Is it a drop tine, a split brow tine, some flyer points, maybe some sticker points? Well, we have them all. Okay, so there's basically four things that cause a buck's rack to be non-typical, and that would be, number one would be hereditary, and the other three mostly are related to injuries. I'm going to talk about the injuries first to give you a better idea. The first one obviously would be an injury to the buck's antler itself. Now that would be the main beam or the points. When that velvet rack is developing, if you look at the rack, the velvet itself is, is silica. It's basically its hairs on the outside. And the inside, that developing antler, which becomes, we call bone, is basically bundles of collagen. And when a rack becomes to a certain stage and those collagen bundles become injured, whether it's a cut or it's a deep bruise or something like that, it causes them to change shape. What happens when a deer is in velvet and it's walking around the woods, jumping across the fence, and it hits its antler, it can deform it during certain stages of the antler growth when it is in velvet. Here is a really good example of that. This is a buck I found while shed antler hunting. It's a, a dead head, but you can see right here, this main beam is tipped down. And that buck hit something when it was in velvet and bent that main beam and caused the buck to not have very good deformity. And voila, you have a non-typical buck. The second type of injury that you see would be to the antler base itself. And a lot of times what you'll see there are little sticker points coming out from the antler bases, maybe an extra brow tine or kind of sort of a brow tine. A lot of times if you look at a rack, I've shot several deer like this. The most recent that I can remember was in Wyoming a couple of years ago. But that rack on that buck would have been a normal eight point rack, four by four. But on the one side, he only basically had, he had four points, but two of the points were low. One was the brow tine and one was coming out next to the brow tine. I suspect on that deer, he had an injury to his antler base itself. Got him, got him, got him, got him. We got him, we got him. Watch him go, watch him go, stay on him. Stay on him. Blood is just pouring out of him. Pouring out of him, go down baby. He went down right there, right in the Egyptian field, yes! Yeah, oh my gosh, oh. We watched this buck for a half an hour. He came across this field, he's a good mature buck. Early season Wyoming, we saw 50 deer tonight. We saw 25 bucks, 
25 rack box and he came up to take a drink right from this water tank here and I could not hold it together and I had to lean out we forgot our chairs we're sitting on a, a rubber made tote that was in, in the back of Eric Dunn's pickup truck and it got him right through there yes Coming up next, Dan and Mark provide some more reasons as to why bucks may not have typical antlers and whether or not they'll be that way year after year. Land of Whitetail is brought to you by Million Dollar Buck Bash powered by Apex Competitions. Hunt, compete, win. Outdoor Edges game processing sets to do it yourself and save. Redneck Blinds, the best hunting blinds on the planet. Cutty Back, Cutty Link, 24 cameras, one cell plan, $10 a month. And by Hunt Stand, the number one hunting app in the country. For hunting, shooting, camping, fishing gear, and more, go to sportsmansguide.com. They sell all the top brands in the industry at unbeatable prices. For everything you need to outfit your passion for a lot less, Go to sportsmansguide.com. Injury reason number one, accidental damage caused prior to the hardening of the velvet covered collagen. Reason number two, damage directed specifically to the base of the antler. And reason number three, well, let's hear it from the pros. So the third injury factor would be to the antler base itself again, just like number two, but in this case, the antlers are already hardened, the deer is polished, and he maybe is fighting or something like that, and that antler breaks off. And when that antler breaks off, part of the antler base breaks off with it. This can be a devastating injury for a buck, and a lot of times what happens is they will develop what is called cranial abscess disease as an after effect of that injury. What happens is that pedicle, that antler base, breaks off, a piece of the skull goes with it, and then in subsequent growing years, that buck might have a non-typical rack. It's seen a lot in places that have high preponderances of mature bucks, places like South Texas where they manage real heavily, places like Midwest in Iowa and Illinois and Wisconsin and even Minnesota and other places where they have older age classes of bucks, lower buck to doe ratios, and a lot of fighting happens during the rut and you're going to see those types of injuries and subsequent antler growth in those situations. So where does that leave genetics? I saved that for last, the best for last so to speak. Genetics ultimately will dictate how big a buck's rack is going to be when he hits maturity. Now that is something very interesting with genetics is you'll see it in regions. Now you'll see it like I said in South Texas where there's areas that will have high incidences of bucks with drop tines. If you get up into my neck of the woods in western Wisconsin, you're gonna see, especially like over in Buffalo County, home of the giant bucks, you're gonna see deer with big non-typical racks that are genetic. You see this in places like Alberta, and you see in other places, in some places of Iowa. But also, when you think about genetics, you also think about places where they don't have non-typicals, but like in western New York, you'll have a lot of deer with just eight and 10 point racks, clean racks, typical racks, but a lot of times you'll see in certain local regional areas, bucks might have a certain configuration on those racks. They might have a longer uh, right brow tine than left brow tine, or the, the configuration on the eights and the tens is the same. This is the same, um, is seen a lot of times with non-typical genetic traits. You'll see certain areas that might throw deer just with just weird, you know, act double brow tines, split G2s, um, like I said, drop tines, flyers, kickers, the little points that go off the sides. Sometimes those are not the result of injury and it's just a matter of what happens to be in the genetic makeup of that local region. Now, outlining the ways bucks can become so-called non-typical, are they gonna be that way year after year? Well, that's not necessarily so. Now, in the case of genetics, it tends to get more augmented or just more of it as they get older. Not always, but most of the time. It's the injury part. If they bump that antler and cause it to go down, weird swing of the uh, main beam or something, that 
may not happen year after year. The next year, they may not bump it. It may be a perfect, great looking five by five buck. Now, as far as if they have an injury to their body, yeah, that is probably gonna cause them, if it's a severe injury, to be a, on the opposite side, a non-typical year after year. If it's just a one year injury, maybe they just uh, broke their leg or twisted an ankle or something like that and it fixes itself, probably not as much. But if you go back to that genetic code, yeah, they're not typical. They're going to be every single year. Coming up next, Mark considers antlers on the opposite side of the symmetrical spectrum. Will large typical bucks be the same year after year? Find out next. Now say you have a white tail buck and he's a 140, a 150, a 160. You can invite me over to hunt, by the way. But if you've got a jumbo like that, is he gonna be that big year after year? Well, you'd hope so, but there are some factors that can cause him to actually have ground shrinkage right there when it's on his head. And what happens? Well, certain years, deer can get stressed, and winter stress is the hardest of all on a deer. That's why they shed their antlers, and stress can actually cause them to shed their antlers even sooner. Now, if they're too stressed, even after they get rid of those antlers and they go through a hard winter, what happens is they rob Peter to pay Paul, so to speak. They're robbing parts of their own body and taking every little bit of extra energy they have and using it to stay alive. So that robs that initial energy burst when they're trying to grow their antlers in the spring. And especially if that winter extends into spring. So you can expect sometimes in severe conditions like that, yeah, it could cause a buck not to have as big an antler. Should I give them minerals or should I give them food? If, if I have to just say one thing, the most important thing for antler development and antler potential and manifesting antler potential is food. You have to provide that deer not only enough food, tonnage, you have to supply the right amount of food but you also have to supply the right kinds of food and that's mostly protein. They're gonna get those minerals through the soil. You know that plant is just a vector of what's in the soil. So what's in the soil that's gonna be uptake into the deer but they need a lot of food and most research will show that a mature buck needs about two tons of forage in a year. That's a lot of food, man. You know, you have to think about how are you providing that? And if you're sitting on your little property like I am, you know, you're hunting 17 acres of habitat and you've got a little quarter acre food plot, you know, that's good, but that's not enough food for the whole year. So you got to think about, okay, what's around me? Is it, is that deer being supplied that amount of food? Or do I need to go hunt somewhere else where I can provide more food like that. A perfect example of this is our own Steve Bartilla. You know, he manages a lot of properties across North America, and the prime one that I've seen, because I've hunted there with him for several years now, is in Illinois. So this year we got to hunt with Steve again, and the day we showed up, he happened to be out that afternoon before we got back. He was out with his Wicked Ridge, and he was, he was hunting for both things. He was hunting for both does and bucks but he had his eye on a couple bucks that he really wanted to take. And we got there just in time to see the end result of a successful hunt for an enormous eight pointer. Um, before I've even done taping up the curtains and stuff, I've seen five different bucks. Wow. Crews on, working the maze in the corner. Wow and spilling out right in front of me. And he was actually, uh, he was actually, you know, I, I mentioned that naturally, there's a flow like this and like this. Well, he came all the way from back in here somewhere, hit that maze and was coming through. And, and the maze actually, uh, there's either he can keep going straight down there or he can turn into the plot. Well, I was banking on him turning into the plot. You know, he didn't turn into the plot. So I went ahead and, uh, <coughs> Grab the grunt tube and hit a deep tending grunt. Freeze. Boom. Look. He's like, I don't really want to push it. I mean, he's only 60 yards away and he's staring right at the redneck. They're acting like this is still the peak of the rub. Okay. 
Um, <clears throat> there's a pretty good chance that even if I don't get a shot at him now, he'll end up circling. I mean, geez, I still got two and a half hours left, two hours left. Well, there's a good chance he'll circle back around. It's about five minutes later now. I'm actually thinking this buck has left my life. Until, and there's a two and a half year old that's out there in the plot, and all of a sudden he's looking back towards the road. Let's turn the camera back on again here. Sure enough, he comes out the other side, and the two and a half year olds are standing there looking all sheepish. And I'm thinking right then that he's gonna, this is gonna be perfect. Very, very mature eight. I uh, wasn't able to get the shot on film. As I said, I don't pretend to be a TV person, a TV hunter in any way, shape or form. Um, but truly mature eight, actually the deer I was really hoping I'd see tonight. And I did. Uh, heck of a blood trail. Always nice when things work. Land of Whitetail is brought to you by Easton. Get armed and deadly with Easton FMJ arrows. Scent Killer Gold with Hunt Dry Technology Plus. Apply it, dry it, and go hunt. 10 Point Crossbow Technologies. There is no substitute. Sever Broadheads. Straight through it. And by Exodus Broadheads by Quality Archery Designs. American made tough. If you can break it, we'll replace it genetics. It's in their genetic code to be a non-typical. Here's a good example of that. My largest whitetail to date come off this ranch that this same non-typical buck come off of. And you can see he's starting to get little kicker points, sticker points, stuff showing up, fork G2, all of the same characteristics on this other giant buck that I shot. Now, had I let this buck go a year or two more, maybe three, he probably would have been a giant too. Regardless, it's a great buck and it's one I couldn't pass up. Could you? Hey guys, today we're with Dan Schultz from Cuddyback. Dan's gonna show us how to link a remote camera on the Cuddyback system to the home camera. Dan, show me how it's done. Sure thing, so when you have a home camera, whether it's non-cell or cell, you've placed it, now we're gonna take and uh, set the remote camera to talk back. It's gonna send its pictures to that home camera and whether I'm gonna go pull that card or whether that camera is sending me the pictures to my phone, it works the same way. Uh, but one thing that's critical is to make sure that the remote camera is in fact talking to the home. Right. If it's not, you're not going to get those pictures, right? And the whole idea of the system is to not have to come back to this camera that we set it and we don't mess with it. So um, in the camera, you're going to go to commands and there's a link menu that, that obviously is the cutting link menu that we're going to connect with. This camera's got to be on a remote. That's a home remote. And when we have the version 8 firmware, I can have up to 23 remotes talking back to that home. So each camera has its own location ID, and those are unique. Then we're gonna set the channel, so whatever that home channel camera has, I've gotta match it. Match that up, because that's how it's talking, that's the, the link network itself that's allowing those cameras to talk. And when I get to the next menu item, it's link level, and what I'll do is I'll let this run, and it's gonna blink, you'll see it's just blinking here. That's searching now for the home camera. Mm -hmm and it's gonna find that camera, and I just need to make sure that when I set this camera that it's at 20 or above. That way I have some leeway that environmental factors, uh, rainy day, a foggy day, things that would knock the signal level down will still allow me to have a good connection between those cameras. So what happens if that link level goes below and the camera is active? So if it was below 20, it's not a problem. If it went down to where it was not connected at all, it would still take pictures and then it would try to reconnect. And when it reconnected, then it would go ahead and send those yep. pictures. That's the beauty of it. Plus it has its own SD card so that in the event that it can't connect for some reason, let's say the home, something happened, it got damaged, at least it would be saving the pictures so I could come pull the card and get the data. Obviously we want to keep it connected so that it's sending and I don't have to do all that. But so right now the link level is 62. 
I'm perfect, I'm well within the range that we need. We're gonna set the camera here. If I wanted to go further, I could walk, start walking away and I could watch this level, it would drop. And you know, as long as I keep it at that 20 level. If we set this camera here, and let's say we wanna put another camera further away from the home, going away from this, if we got so far away that it couldn't talk to the home, now it would connect to this camera to send back to the home. So it's going from that camera to this camera to the home camera. Right, you know, in today's environment, uh, pulling a card is, is not a problem. It, it lets you stay away from the other cameras. But getting that to your phone is just more timely. It's a lot more fun because you're kind of living in the moment of what's happening in the property. So sure. that's definitely the way the world seems to be moving. But uh, no doubt when we originally came up with this, the whole idea behind Cuddy Link is to allow you to have multiple cameras, getting the data, and not having to go out to the property and disturb the deer and the wildlife that's there so that hopefully you have better hunting opportunities.